Tonight I'm going to talk about, again, joy. And uh, that's elusive to us in today's world. It's, we've said numerous times it's not the easiest choice, but not the most obvious to choose joy. Especially when you turn on the news, when you receive a diagnosis or you look at your life. I'd like to give a health warning on it. What I'm going to talk about is a perspective. A perspective is that I spoke a few weeks ago about an overview effect. Is when we step back actually, and we see the bigger picture about our future wealth, our present wealth, and our past wealth, that that changes our minds about joy. But I'm also acutely aware that actually what's directly in front of you can be the biggest thing ever. When I used to be in the police, and I used to be in the police, everyone would go, oh yeah. But, um, but I used to deal with stuff, and I used to think, oh my goodness, this is huge, and this is an armed surveillance job, et cetera, et cetera. But I left the police, and then suddenly the shopping list would become the huge thing in front of me, if you see what I mean. It's whatever's in front of you then can be huge and in front of you. So I don't want to belittle anyone's struggle tonight, but what I want to do is give a perspective, uh, a kind of Paul line, Paul, who writes the letter to Philippians, perspective on life. And so I wrote this sermon uh, in just as we came out of being in Uganda in the refugee camps in uh, northern Uganda for three and a half weeks as a whole family with the lovely Hills family. And having visited South Sudan, which is a country that's been ravaged by war, civil war for many years. And we were planting and uh, beginning through the Hope Health Action Charity. We were privileged to be there as they kind of started to open the first medical facility back in South Sudan, in Keji Keji. So that's the kind of perspective in it. But I think it speaks into our, our context today. So when we talk, it's about that wall that we can build up and that tree that is on offer to us that sometimes we find it elusive or the heart that's hardened. Or Sarah had a word this morning about a banner being poured over us and waved over us as the banner of God's love which goes and harkens back to encounter evenings that we had a while ago where uh, Phil had that banner of the beloved, you know, that was being poured over the, us as human beings. But sometimes we can be so distracted and our perspective, our views, our glasses that we wear we get kind of lost. And so that's the kind of thing. So, in his book, The Progress Paradox, which I know all of you have read. No, only joking. But Greg Easterbrook explores the paradox that we have more in the Western world than we've ever had, have ever. In the 20, uh, uh, 21st century, we have more than we can ever imagine. We have more opportunity than any other generation ever. We have more wealth. We have better medical care. We have prosperity. And yet the percentage of people that, ha uh, that are happy hasn't gone up for 70 years. So we have more and more and more. Yet we are no happier. In fact, recent surveys have uh, looked at it and seen that actually we're on the decline with happiness. So we have more than we can imagine. We see that we're men and women in the middle class. You know, I always laugh and joke to my family now because Liz is from a different class to me, as you can imagine. If you ever met Liz, she's very posh. And I'm not. I'm from South London. And we became middle class when we got a house uh, in Coulsdon. And we moved from Thornton Heath to Coulston. It was like, ah, now this is a different kind of area. And that was when I was about 15. So when I became middle class, and those that are middle class, I know some of you aren't here today, but we are in 99.4% of the world is less better off than us. We're in a 0.6% of the wealthiest people in the world. Do we have a perspective like that very often? So we are deeply, deeply privileged. You know, Robert Frank, a professor of economics at Cornell University, noted that in petrol stations now, you can go into the petrol station and buy a bottle of wine, a bottle of wine that could be uh, whatever is your fancy, a Cabernet or as... Um, Abby said on the, I, I recently had Chardonnay and as I was talking to Abby on the Holy Spirit day, she goes, I don't like Chardonnay. So you can have a Sauvignon Blanc. But those wines that you can pick up from that place are better quality than the kings of France. Louis the uh, 16th, 17th, the sun king would have drunk. 
So the quality we have and the access we have to it is unprecedented. We have an amazing life if we look at it. Yet, if you're like me, I spend all my time looking at what I don't have or what I need. So I need to wake up and I need to have my coffee. The world will spin without me having my coffee and it has to be a certain kind of coffee from a certain type of coffee shop. Otherwise, I can't function. How ridiculous is that? But I've fallen into it. What's our perspective into that? Psychologists say today that isolation, sorrow, bitterness, anxiety, loneliness and despair are in today's world of the United States and the European Union greater concerns than any supply of any material item. They far outweigh. The World Health Organization has identified the United States, Meg, don't listen to this, the United States, the most advanced economy in the Western world, is by foremost the most anxious country in the world, to the point that almost a third of Americans people are likely to suffer from an anxiety disorder in their lifetime. And I believe that the UK is no different from what we hear and what we meet and what I experience myself sometimes. We can be filled with doubt and fear and anxiety. And it's crushing and it's, it can stop us. How can that be when we have more education, more wealth, more food, more stuff, yet less happiness? Yet, in the month of August, as I explained, Liz, the girls, Grace, Alice and Lily, and the Hills family, we spent over three and a half weeks in those refugee camps in northern Uganda and South Sudan, where the quota for rice supplied by the UN had dropped from 15 kilograms for a family to three kilograms. 15 to three. And we were worried about what we were eating. I can't imagine what that would happen to me. I also walked alongside a pastor that broke stones 12 hours a day, three days a week, so he could lead his church and provide for his family. Hand on my heart. I don't know if I'd do that to lead this church sometimes. Do you know what I mean? We got so comfortable. I've got a stipend, I get a wage, I get a house, and I can think about what I don't get. Oh, what I could do. Oh, the money's tight. Oh my goodness, we were given a perspective of life over there. 15 kilograms to 3 kilograms. And it goes unnoticed because it's about the war in Ukraine that's caused that drop in rice supply for the people of the refugee camps. And they have to make difficult decisions. Yet, yet in those heartbreaking stories of pain, of struggle, of death and hunger, walking alongside people who have lost limbs in the Civil War, that are getting a prosthetic fitted for the first time, oh my goodness, we saw joy. Oh my goodness, we saw celebrations. People slept out for three days in the medical centre we were at to get a prosthetic limb fitted. And oh my goodness, they celebrated when they did. There was not one word of complaint. I can't imagine me doing that in A&E in this country. It's like, I'm not being funny. I've been here four hours. They were there for three days. Just gives you a perspective. It doesn't say it's right or wrong, but what it does is it gives them a, us a perspective of what the world is dealing with. And then there's a picture that's going to come up, hopefully, of Waddy. Waddy was a little boy that I met, became my firm and friend. Waddy suffers from, uh, or is blessed with, Down syndrome. And we were in a room packed with kids that were so excited to see us that you couldn't get in the classroom. And it was boiling. And I was like sweating, thinking, oh my goodness, I am losing some weight, which I needed to do. Yet, what he just held my hand. And he, I just gave him a, one of the crafts that I had, which was like a pencil with a ribbon on the back. And my goodness, he found joy. And so, what he... When I get low, I think of Waddy, and I think of his love, love of life. And I think of Waddy's mum, who was never downhearted, and she delighted, you know, in that, in that culture, Waddy could be seen as a curse by the community, but not to his mum. 
to his mum what he was the best thing and taught her about the joy of Christ. My goodness, in the ups and downs of this week, I look at Waddy and go, that's the joy of Christ. You know, I've been up in uh, London with uh, General Synod uh, for Monday, Tuesday. Not a place of joy, but I've also been on the Alpha uh, in the evening, and that was a place of joy. And then we've been with Liz's dad's funeral, and that was a place of joy and grief and up and down. And then on Friday, we went, and I was privileged enough to do June now at Parish Administrator's mum funeral, and that was an amazing place of joy and hurt. And so I I look at those ups and downs, and when I get anxious, when I get fear, when there's doubts, I lift my perspective towards stories like Waddy in my life. As we come into land on this series of joy, we don't give up on joy, we just press into joy. It's not the easiest or most obvious choice, but nonetheless, the joy of Christ is what should be radiating out of us as Christians. As we finished the Alpha Away Day yesterday, I looked at different people, and you could see in the team, in the guests, there was a joy that was in their faces. That is the joy of Christ that people ask questions and go, what are you carrying? That doesn't come from us, that comes from the Holy Spirit in us. The joy of Christ. And so Paul says something about this as we land in chapter 4 something about this and he gives us and we need to press in and lean in because he gives us a statement as we come in the last few verses. He says that he's found a secret, the secret of contentment. Now, I hear that and that makes me lean into scripture. It's when someone tells you something that can change your life, you want to press in more. So when St. Paul in the letters to the Philippians, he's writing from jail, he says he's found a secret of contentment. It makes me want to lean in, especially when I've got that fear, that anxiety, anxiety, that loneliness that the Western world is cursed with. When I've seen the joy with those who have little and I think, oh, they're content. What? How do you get there? I think the words of scripture enable us to get there. So let's read some of that. So the translation might be slightly different as comes up. But chapter four, verses 10 of the letter to the Philippians. I rejoiced in the word greatly, because once again you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me, but lack opportunity to show it. Show it. I don't say this out for me, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know both how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot, and in all circumstances. I have learned the secret of being content whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or need, I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Powerful words. Powerful words that in that need and hungry. If I don't have food, my family will tell you I get hangry. There is something in prayer and fasting that I have to get through that isn't pretty. And so that's the perspective. Yet he talks about a secret, a secret of contentment. A reminder, Paul is penning this letter, not sipping a gin and tonic by a pool in a hot country. He is sipping rainwater whilst in a prison. under, And he is far from content in that place if you were with him. If you were in his circumstances, yet he is completely content. He's been wrongly accused, he's been improperly imprisoned, yet he's preaching the news of Jesus Christ. So it's ironic that we go to the person who's in chains, the person who has been wrongly accused, who has received injustice, who is in terrible circumstances. We go to that person to hear about contentment, just as I found contentment in Waddy's face and story. The person that you'd expect not to be content is completely content. The people you expect to be completely content because they have everything aren't content because they're wanting more. Whenever I visited anyone in prison, and I visited a lot in different, two different ways, when I've met them, not often are they content and speaking of joy. Quite often they're talking about the injustice of their situation and their anger. They wouldn't write a a book about joy, yet 
Paul writes this letter, this book of joy from prison. And I think that's the great authenticator of it, is he's writing it in difficult circumstances. When someone tells you they're carrying joy and everything seems to be going well, it doesn't really kind of hit home. But when someone writes you and tells you that they're filled with joy and they're going through the most difficult struggles, as I looked at my beautiful wife on Thursday, she was filled with joy, with tears in her eyes, in the most difficult circumstances, as the most Christian, beautiful man who, as her dad, we celebrated passing. And that's the joy in those circumstances. It's the privilege to walk through people. And so I think this passage offers us a number of different points that we should press into, into this secret of contentment. The first one is contentment is a byproduct of our identity, our proper identity in Jesus Christ. When we are set on a rock with our identity set in Christ, then we aren't tossed in the waves. Then we aren't discontented. Then we aren't sad and anxious but we press into that identity over and over again. Paul leads us back to his identity being in what? In Christ. Over and over you'll find him say, I am in Christ. Henri Nguyen, the Catholic priest, writes in the book, The Life of the Beloved, a great book. I have read entirely that. He says that every person is tempted to ground their identity in three lies. The first one. I'm, I'm grounded in all three. So I'm just sharing, you're my therapy session as I just talk through what's my problems. It might ray, uh, sort of ring a bell to you. The first thing that we lies, I am what I have. I am what I have. So immediately we look at what car someone drives or what house they live in or what clothes. We're immediately making just judgments, what university they went to. We're immediately making stuff about people, yet we also do it about ourselves. Sometimes we want to ask the question about someone, oh, where do you live? Because we want to share where we live, because that says more about our identity. And so we are really concerned about what we have. The second is, this is so me, so what I do. What I do. We are what we do. So our identity is set in what we do. So someone reminded me this morning that you ask that question desperately sometimes for someone to ask you, what do you do? So you can share, oh, I've got this identity. And so when I was a policeman, I was like, oh, yeah, policeman. Sometimes as a vicar, you go, oh, I'm a vicar and keep it quite quiet. And sometimes in different settings, oh, I'm a vicar. So I am what I do. That's another lie. So I, ha I am what I have. I am what I do. The third thing is I am what other people say or think about me. So other people's words matter. So you care more about what other people think of you rather than what Jesus thinks of you. They're the three lies that can keep us distracted and anxious and not content. Now there's problems here because identifying these three things means that these three things can be taken away from you just like that. That they're temporal. So the things we have could be taken away by a bad stock deal or a uh, loss of job or anything about your finances and what you have. We, I know friends that have lost their houses, not by uh, terrible decisions, but sometimes they've just lost it and they've lost their identity. They've had to move somewhere else. It might be a car crash away from losing your car and suddenly, oh, your identity is not what you do. So we judge people, but we can lose it quite easily. I am what I do. We're just a redundancy or retirement away from losing your identity. One of the things that they used to counsel people as they left the police and I'd left, leave the military and people when they retire is, how do you cope without an identity in retirement? So when you say to people, what do you do? And they go, well, I, I'm retired. I used to, but actually you are so much worth in retirement. You've got so much to give. You're a child of God. You're still an evangelist, still a preacher, still a teacher, still a prophet. That doesn't go away because that's set in the identity of Christ. And so that's such a difficult question. It's like, and when you've maybe lost your job and you have to say, I don't, you know, I've lost my job. It's a painful thing because you feel judged immediately. I love, I walk with Jonathan and Jonathan said that in New York they've got these dinner parties now. 
do, if I've got this wrong, Jonathan, do. Uh, but you're not allowed to ask that question. They bring guests in that don't know each other and you're not allowed to ask the question, what do you do? Because actually you then get to know the person better. Because immediately you want to know what to do, it becomes transactional. So if they say they're a multimillionaire, you're going, this is a good friend. If they say that they're behind the, the, jump, uh, the bar at a pub, you're thinking, well, that might be quite nice, but that's not the transactional. Immediately you're flitting into stuff. I'm just being honest. <laughs> and so, you know, I think, you know, bearing that in mind. And what, you, and when, what you th- other people think of you. And a word, if you are living for praise, you're going to die by criticism. If you're looking for someone to praise you, if you need to have that word of praise, when a a critical word comes, it will crush you. And so, you know, um, when we moved and came to Crawley, there was a number of things said about us because we were planting a church slightly different in the town centre and everyone had an opinion about what we should do and who we were. What I learned really quickly was I can never control my reputation. People will say what they want about me because they don't know me. And they'll say things about you because they don't know you and don't know your heart. And it really hurts. I'm not going to say it doesn't. But I have to come to God in my true identity and know that I'm a beloved son. And so the only thing I can deal with in those situations is my integrity. Have I done the right thing? Have I set my identity in Christ? And so those words kind of bounce off after a while. It is a process. If we find our identities in these things, what we do, or what we work at, what we do then is, with these three lies, we try to do everything we can to protect them. And so we build a wall around ourselves on what we have, what we do, and what people think about us. And what happens then is become really ungenerous. We start to hoard God's gifts to us. And we start not being generous to other people. When we know those gifts and uh, the things we do for a job and our identity set in Christ, we become incredibly generous with the things that God has given us. And so that's the secret of contentment, is generosity. Because it doesn't come from us. It comes from God. And so how do we do that? Well, how do we practically step into that? I think scripture is the key. It's like the uh, image uh, of the thorns and the power of the soil. We replace the thorns in our soil with seeds of God's words, of his perfect truth. So instead of thinking, I am what I have, I think about scripture and think to all those who believed in what John 1, 12, in him and accepted him, gave the right to become children of God. I remind myself I'm a child of God. Instead of thinking of what I do, I've got to know that I am a beautiful poem, work of art that God has done without doing anything for him. There'll be other verses that you can sow into the seeds, into the soil of your life. And when I think about the words that are spoken over me by others, I come back to the baptism of Jesus every time and know that the words spoken over Jesus are spoken over each one of us. I am the beloved son or daughter of Christ, of whom he's well pleased, despite anything I've done in the past. That is grace. So, first thing is that Paul tells us to set our identity time and time again in Christ, nothing else. So maybe tonight we'll pray for you to not believe those lies, to let go of that identity of what you do. Number two, I think our contentment, the secret of contentment is bolstered, is grown in community. Verse 10 says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. You're in fact concerned about me, but lack the opportunity to show it. Now the church of Philippi was a community that Paul had invested in, that he loved. We've been saying that he knew these people when he wrote this letter and he'd built up relationships, cultivated community and they were in fact Investors, they were financially supporting Paul at one time, but we don't know why, but they somehow disconnected with him. 
But what does Paul do? He doesn't get annoyed with them when, say, as a vicar, you can get annoyed when someone leaves your church and you cut them off and you don't speak to them. What he does is open up his heart again and again to them and say, come home. Let's be connected. Let's keep relationship going. And so the secret of contentment is always reaching out again and again and choosing and giving opportunities for people to have connection and be connected together. Question, how many have you been in a friendship and relationship that all of a sudden you've ghosted or someone else has ghosted you? All of us, I think due to circumstances sometimes, have been on the end of or have been doing to someone that exact thing. When you've invested, you've poured in your heart, you see a friendship grow and then it just disappears. Paul says to us tonight through his letter in the secret of contentment is that our response is to, dr- to respond in grace, to extend grace to them. He keeps them in the fold. So much soul, they send Amphrodite to travel 800 miles to bring a care package to him. Probably some clothes, some other stuff. What are those people that have stepped away? What are those people that we have lost connection with that we need to reach out again? As we come up to Easter, we've baptised over 110 people now, I think, in this church since full of mer- mer- baptism since we've been here, which is the grace of God. But I think as we go towards that, is it's good to reflect and pray through those 110 because they've been put into our care and see where they're at. Reconnect with grace. I love Johnny Gumbel's talks at uh, Focus. The highlight was Johnny Gumbel's t- sort of Bible studies in the morning. But he talked about going in the opposite spirit. Sometimes in our insecurities, when we lose connection with people, we go in the opposite spirit and we cut them off and we isolate them. I think we're called to step again and not get judgmental, not get angry, but extend that offer of grace again and again. I think that's part of the secret of contentment. When Liz and I were broken, our marriage was separated before we became Christians and we came to faith, Ashington Church, the community that we found ourselves in, could have rejected both of us because of the circumstances in a judgmental way. But they didn't. What they did was offer care and support to each of us. They extended God's grace again and again and again. So I wonder whether tonight someone's calling you to create a care package, a postcard of joy, a chocolate bar. I don't know what it is. A phone call or a WhatsApp, a text to someone that you've become completely estranged with. And it's causing you to have sleepless nights because it's annoying you. Imagine you maybe to go in the opposite spirit that you think you should and extend that joy and that care package to someone tonight. I think that what Paul does in, in his... Uh, prison cell is he goes oh it's not going well and I've lost connection with those guys I'm going to write a letter that's just going to be a full of God's grace and they respond with a care package sent 800 miles flight to the south of France to here over risky terrain in love and so the first byproduct of a proper identity is bolstered in community when we reach out Contentment is not based on circumstances, it's based on our calling. So maybe tonight, is, tonight is, as in verse 11, is to step into and press into what your calling might be. He says in this letter that he has learned the secret of contentment. So he's gone through experiences, yet he is in prison, yet he carries joy. The reason he has joy is because he knows who he is and what he's called to do. He knows his purpose and his calling. Sometimes we are in the wrong place at the wrong time, and we can feel it. 
Sometimes we're in the right place and it's a hard time, but we just need to stick into our calling. And so tonight we're going to offer space and maybe prayer. We may not do communion tonight for those, but we might do just prayer ministry tonight. Because I've got, had a couple of words that people have shared and I'd love to, I think that unlocks something. So just to prepare you in your mind. Philip Yancey writes in The Spiritual Seeker, uh, about a spiritual seeker that is discontented with their calling and wants more. He says, this spiritual seeker interrupted their busy, crazy work schedule and went to a monastery. He went there and showed up and a monk invited him and said to him, we hope you have a blessed time here. Now, if there's anything you need at all, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and we'll teach you how to survive without that thing you need. So they turn up and say, oh, is there anything you need? As soon as you say you will need something, they'll say, we'll teach you how you don't need that because all you need is Christ. That's Paul in his, in his vocation, his calling. He knew, who, he knew who he was and he knew his calling. His calling, you know, as Christians, his calling and our purpose is worked out by reading God's word, by coming in hours of prayer, of travailing in tears sometimes with God. It's also done by speaking to other mature Christians. It's gathering friends round. It's keeping a journal about seeing where the same strands might be spoken into your life. It's keeping those life verses in your Bible, going back to them and praying through them. And so we love to help you on that journey if you're wondering what your calling is. But if you're having doubts about your calling, often that is a time that you're under attack. When you then suddenly say, well, this is my calling, and you step back into it, you find a peace and contentment. Fourthly, contentment does not mean complacency. Quite often we think that actually to be content means that we are sitting by the side of a lake with tranquil, still waters and just in peace. There are moments of our life is like that, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but that isn't the call of the Christian life. We're taught to pick up our cross and follow Jesus, which means that he doesn't say there won't be suffering, but he will be with us through that suffering. There, there will be joy despite of that suffering. And so that complacency is when we have the love of Jesus poured into us, when we experience God's love, then we can't help but respond in worship and obeying if love if God's love is poured into us when it's poured into us the natural response and our response is love to God and it's spelled O-B-E-Y we obey his word we obey his calling and we get active with his mission not in our pace of life it's, um, but in his pace his grace and his space Joy is pursuing God's calling and the peace to trust God's sovereignty in the midst of it all. Finally, contentment is only found in Christ. Verse 13, I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. It's easy to pull this verse out, isn't it? It's likely to be a sticker on the back of someone's car. It's one of the most text or um, WhatsApp messages to someone who's struggling. It's on a notebook, on a postcard. It's when someone's going for an athletic or academic endeavour. When someone's struggling, we send it through. I can do anything I want through him who gives me strength. I want that thing and that job and I can do anything. I can go and get it. Trouble is when it doesn't happen, when there is disappointment, then we find ourselves in a bad place. And maybe we blame God. I praise the Lord that God didn't answer my prayer when my first girlfriend from university broke up and I thought, I really want to have her back. I've made a terrible mistake. And I really prayed and I prayed and I prayed. But praise the Lord that God did not answer that prayer because I wouldn't have married my wonderful wife, Liz. And so he doesn't mean that you just name it and claim it. I can do all things because we concentrate on the I can I can, I can, I can and we fell through Christ through Christ because Paul tells us actually in this passage that he is content in all circumstances because actually he's saying that he's both hungry and he's uh, well fed 
that he has abundance, yet he has need. And he can do all things in spite of any circumstances through Christ in this. Which means by being in Christ, it changes what we pray for. So, that's it. I'm nearly done. I just want to take us back to the summer, uh, our summer, in 40 degree heat in the refugee camps. There's no fans. There's just a place of intense heat. People gather. Sweat is pouring down us. The place is filled with former alcoholics or those struggling with addictions that's live in the refugee camps. Those with limbs missing that haven't got prosthetics, they've dragged themselves there probably five to six miles to come to church. It's a place of testimonies of God's grace. The unbelievable of God's abundance and joy. It's a place where the youth dance down and cannot help but dance down the middle of the church in praise. It's a place where mums that have lost children come forward and tell about the grace of God. It's where mums with children with disabilities celebrate their children. They'd lost everything in a worldly sense, but gained everything in a Christian Christ sense. There was no way for them to experience joy, yet Jesus had found a way for them to experience joy. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, fell in that place. And there was joy in the heat, in the pain, in a place where you think God had probably forgotten, but he hasn't forgotten at all. It's a place of encounter, of purpose and joy. It's the seeds we need to sow tonight in our lives to lift our perspective to experience the joy of Christ. Shall we stand?